This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. For all of your website needs, Squarespace is the place to go. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to share with you my favorite Fujifilm XF lenses as of October 2020. These are the kinds of lenses that once you buy them, you're done. You simply lose interest in looking for anything else because they just plain work, and you know they'll go the distance with you. Of course, you may have different priorities and sensibilities than I do, and that's fine. We all have our own unique mixtures of wants, needs, budgets, and uh, psychopathology. Gas, anyone? But for me, over many, many reviews, I'll put a link to all of our Fujifilm videos down in the description, show notes if you will, below, I've figured out that for stills, this means a pair of primes, for video, a pair of zooms, which can also pull double duty for stills. Why? Well, because when I'm shooting stills, I'm almost invariably shooting on the street, and then I want small, light, and fast. Small and light because I'm carrying everything for hours on end. I want to be unobtrusive, and especially when I'm shooting street, I prefer to see the world one field of view at a time. I've learned that I see more of what I'm looking for this way, and I've found it is always easier when engaging people to do it with a small, unassuming camera and lens combination. Fast. Because the distances, fields of view, depths of field, and shutter speeds at which I shoot often require an aperture faster than f2. But sometimes, when I'm covering political events in particular, rallies, protests, I want the reach and flexibility that certain zooms can give me. Stills or video, I also prefer my lenses to be weather sealed. When I'm shooting video, I always want flexible fields of view that I can adjust without changing lenses, sometimes without changing camera position because I simply don't have that choice or the time. I want quick, quiet, and smooth, continuous autofocus. I want no chromatic aberration because it looks horrible, it looks cheap, and it is virtually impossible to correct in post. But I still want to pack small and light with easy setup and takedown. The flip side is what I don't need in each case Though, again, your set of trade-offs may differ. For stills work, I don't really care about continuous autofocus performance, nor do I care about how fine-grained or smooth are aperture adjustments. I don't shoot sports, wildlife, or runway. I don't care about focus breathing because that's irrelevant to photography. I don't care as much as I used to about lens-based image stabilization, given the focal lengths I typically use, as well as the negligible performance gains of lens IS when the X-T4 and now X-S10 already have IBIS. I generally don't care about ultra-wides because I don't, for example, do interior or architectural photography per se, and I don't see the world super-wide in any case. Except when I do. And while chromatic aberration drives me to distraction, irrespective of whether I'm shooting stills or video and I don't want it, at least I can correct usually most of it in individual photos and posts. Though again, I'd much rather never have it do so because it is, for me as well, a joy of shooting thing. If I see chromatic aberration, it just makes me unhappy. It makes me feel that the manufacturer doesn't care about image quality as much as I do, and then I regret spending the money with them in the first place. For videography, I generally don't care about apertures faster than f2.8, because I want at least a minimum depth of field that's workable.
Well, that's the thing about movement. Depth of field too shallow becomes a sixth level pain in the I generally don't care about smooth, clickless aperture changes, though I recognize many videographers and filmmakers do, because I can't think of a single instance where I've shot under such dramatic and immediate changes in light that this was necessary, and I never zoom during a shot with a variable aperture lens. As is the case with stills, I care less about lens IS than I used to for video, given, again, the excellent IVIS and the X-T4 and X-S10, especially when using the IS boost mode, so handheld lockdown shots, that's great. If we want really smooth dynamic shots, we'll likely be shooting at the wider end and using a gimbal anyway. What all four of my favorite Fujifilm XF lenses have in common are that they have proven themselves in the real world and given me wonderful imagery. They offer excellent image quality, build quality, handling, industrial design, and real dedicated aperture rings. They are reasonably compact and reasonably priced. But before I reveal my top picks, I do want to take a moment to thank the good people at Squarespace for making this episode possible. Now, normally when I do this, I've already gone into voiceover mode like this and share with you imagery of Squarespace's website, as well as our own websites, which in fact are all built using Squarespace, going back to our very first one in 2000, either 13 or 14. I just don't remember. I kind of think it was 2013. Don't hold me to that. The point is, we're really happy with how easy they've made it for us. I then tell and show you how we use Squarespace not only for website design that form the backbone of our business, but for hosting, domain registration, e-commerce, shipping, scheduling, and most recently, even email hosting through their partnership with Google because I was unhappy with the email provider I had. I tell you and show you that they're great for small to mid-sized business in just about any industry from solopreneurs on up. And then, just like now, I tell you how to get a free trial and save 10% on your first order by going over to www.squarespace.com slash you and then using the discount code Hugh at checkout when you decide to move beyond the trial to actually go for it. But today, I want to look you in the eye, virtually speaking anyway, to say this. Truly, not only that Squarespace has been instrumental in getting our business off the ground, not only that their continuing support of our work through their sponsorship of episodes like this is deeply meaningful to us, but how much your support, dear viewers, means to us. You are why we make these videos. Anyway, if you're thinking about creating a website, your first or your 50th, or upping your game from an existing website, do hop over to www.squarespace.com slash hue. And if you like what you see, save yourself 10% at checkout by using the discount code HUE. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Squarespace. Okay, without further ado, my favorite Fujifilm lenses. Number one, primarily for street photography, the XF16 1.4. I know this is not the typical field of view for classic street photography, but man, does this field of view work for me. This lens works for me not simply because the 16 1.4 is the equivalent of my favorite full-frame wide-angle field of view, 24 millimeters, nor that f1.4 gives me the full-frame equivalent depth of field of f2, sufficient for the way I shoot to give me the separation between foreground and background when I want it. It's that the image quality is superb. This is one of my favorite images of all time, for example, a 27 by 40 inch print of which hangs on our wall taken with the 16 1.4 mounted on an X-T2. And the 16 1.4 is lovely in hand. It is small, well-built and finished, has a heft and permanence to it. It has a real aperture ring and a manual focus clutch with hard stops. Oh, baby. Weather sealing, snappy autofocus, and a price of a thousand bucks round out the reasons why it's one of my favorite lenses, irrespective of mount or sensor size. Number two for street photography and portraiture, although I usually combine both, the 56 1.2. Not a typical choice for street photography either, but in the age of a minimum of six feet for responsible social distancing, this full-frame equivalent of call it an 85 1.8 has become, for me anyhow, the new normal. More importantly, it has given me some of my favorite street portrait shots wide open, again, irrespective of sensor format or brand like this. I 
I have to pixel peep to see differences between it and the brand new 51.0, an impressive optic in its own right. Yet when I do pixel peep, those differences don't always accrue to the advantage of the 1.0. Although the 1.0 does have the weather sealing, the 56 1.2 does not. Still, the 56 1.2 is significantly smaller, lighter, and less obtrusive than the 1.0. It autofocuses better than the 56 1.2 APD. The differences among the three of them in separating foreground and background are not meaningful to me. And when it is not on sale for as little as 850 bucks as it was the last time I looked, but instead the more usual 1000 the regular 56 1.2 is still a third less expensive than either of those other guys. Then again, for half that price, Fujifilm's XF50 F2 Fujicron focuses better, is much smaller and lighter, and weather sealed, but the extra reach, that particular rendering, and the feel of the 56 1.2 do it for me. Let's in fact call the Fujicron trio of 2335 and 50 F2s honorable mentions, the XC35 F2 an incredible bargain. Number three, for video and stills, the Red Badge XF 16-55 Now this lens blew me away the first time I chimped images through the EVF, and then I saw why when I pixel peeped afterwards in post, it is one of the most uniform, edge-to-edge, -edge, sharpest, tastiest, and best corrected no focus breathing lenses I've ever used in a compact, beautifully built package that gives me the full frame equivalent field of view and depth of field of a 24 to 80 f4. It sparkles as good and usually better than any 24 to 70 f4 full frame lens with which I'm familiar. And the autofocus is good. It's a real sleeper. If in fact I could have just one lens to do it all on an X-T4 or X-S10, this would be it. At 1200 bucks, it isn't cheap, but it is weather sealed. It does have lens IS, and as I just mentioned, its autofocus performance is excellent. Number four for video and stills, the Red Badge XF 50 to 142.8. Like the 16 to 55, this Red Badge lens is just stellar. It carries over all that make the 16 to 55 outstanding. It is absolutely as good as the best 70 to 200 F4 I have ever used. It's also the most expensive lens of the bunch, 1600 bucks, and the biggest. It's about as big, actually, as Sony's also outstanding 70 to 200 f4, and it costs 100 more than the Sony. But if you're in the Fujifilm world, this is pretty much a must have lens, along with the 16 to 55, for event work, and you're giving up nothing except in the dark to full frame. I've compared these red badge zooms to their full frame F4 counterparts because of depth of field equivalency, but given their maximum 2.8 apertures, one can argue that they should also be compared to the 2.8 full frame equivalents. I understand. At that point, differences in price, size, and weight do accrue to the advantage of the red badge zooms, and unless you shoot wide open at 2.8 on full frame zooms often, I think it is fair to compare these red badge zooms on an image quality basis because they are that good. There you have it, the four go-to lenses for Fujifilm XF cameras for those of us doing the kind of work we do. One more thing. The last honorable mention has to go to the improved 23F2 built into the $1,400 X100V. I didn't notice while I was shooting, but every time I look at an image I've captured with it, I am impressed, and some of my favorite images over the last year have come from this great little street shooter. Like this. really doesn't get much better, irrespective of brand or format. That's it. This episode was made possible by Squarespace. Thanks, Squarespace.